Hey folks, I'm Dave Ackley. It's time for another Tea Tuesday update. Let's take a minute to look at this. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Here were the goals for the T Tuesday update today. Uh, here are the results. Uh, the monthly plans to reach the ancestor. Uh, we'll uh, spend most of the time talking about that. What we just saw was a demo of HC3 hard cell 3 mobile content. We'll talk about that again. Was supposed to get a demo book ready in PDF. I failed at that, but I did buy a block of ISBNs. I'll talk about that at the end. Have some fun. Yeah, it did pretty okay. All right, so here is the, you know, this is what passes for my clickbait title, you know, that I'm going to use for the, the, the card, to build new life in 180 days, you know, and, and, and this thing here, uh, uh, it, you know, we'll see it a little bit later in another demo, but, you know, it's, it's an, it, the a substrate for what I hope is going to be our new life in 180 days, you know, so it's like... Uh, uh, to build new life, and we'll see how it goes. All right, yes, today is July 5th. January 1st is 180 days from today. So, uh, you know, okay, if we're going to say we're going to build new life, we got to have some kind of clear agreement <laughs> on what life is supposed to be. Here's the definition I usually use. Life is a system that works to preserve its pattern. Uh, uh, where works means actually, you know, like uses energy, like, you know, pulleys and levers or whatever, or chemical reactions. Uh, uh, doesn't necessarily mean, you know, punch a clock, although it could mean that. Uh, uh, and that, uh, if, if, if we observe a system doing work, to preserve its pattern, that is life. And so that's what we're gonna make. We can do it inside uh, digital computers. We can do it inside the T2 tile grid. That's what we're gonna do. Not all things that capable of satis of, of not all things that preserve patterns are actually satisfying forms of life. Uh, with you know computers these days, it's trivial to copy anything, uh, uh, you know, from a ringtone to, a, I don't know, Instagram filter, I don't even know what they do these days. Uh, um, so to be satisfying, we have a few properties. You know, number one, it has to actually work to preserve its pattern somehow. And, and so things like a rock sitting on the beach being really rigid and tough, it, it preserves its pattern for a long time, but it's not actually working at it and so we're going to rule that out but in addition not just enough to work work to preserve the pattern it, it needs to actually have program driven replication some uh, thing inside it that passes for code and something that passes for an interpreter uh, an, an execution unit something that transfer translates that code into work uh, into changes in uh, physical space confirmation uh, um, that's the key element that we want for satisfying new life and that's what we're going after in this one and now you know in the t2 tile project when we're using ulam every time we t come up with a ulam program a collection of elements that we compile together to make a bespoke physics a custom physics uh, uh, that is a whole new set of rules that we could then conceivably imagine having a program driven replication on top of. And, you know, we can design rules like, you know, the fork bomb rule. You know, you just plop a fork bomb down and it copies itself in every direction. That's very, it definitely is preserving itself. It's definitely uh, doing work to do it, uh, but it's not a satisfying form of new life because the program driven replication is, you know, a fork bomb cannot be anything else 
but a fork bomb. What we're after with program-driven replication is a certain amount of generality, that the program could do other things either instead of or better in addition to preserving its pattern. Uh, uh, so what we're going to try to do is not grease the skids any more than we have to. And this is, you know, an inherent challenge for artificial life, especially software-based artificial life, which is kind of what we're doing because you know software is so flexible so we, we can put things into the physics that help us out and we're totally going to do that but we want to be upfront and honest about it and try to minimize it so you know the whole t2 tile project we're working for years to say well this is a set of good things that we should implement this is the way that would be good things to do computing because it's natural for being indefinitely scalable it's natural for being like incredibly robust and tough so therefore it's not that we're greasing the skids to make it easier for program driven replication Location. But, uh, uh, you know, my intention is to succeed at this challenge. My success is to ha have the ancestor running on July 3rd, uh, July, January 3rd, 2023. Uh, um, and in, to do that with, you know, and if I have to grease the skids, I'll grease the skids. But hopefully, as lesser rather than more, although actually I have an argument that says, you know, trying to make everything as low level as possible and minimal, you know, reduced instruction set computing, computing everything with one type of gate, you know, is actually a bad idea. So I'm going to have to put a star next to that. I'm going to grease the skids in a certain way, but I'm going to claim it's good. Uh, uh, all right. So here is the plan. Uh, we're going to use the HC3, the hard cell three uh, diamond grids uh, as the basic structure of the organism. And we're going to use a diamond chain, which is what we saw in the opening video. We had a diamond uh, a diamond grid that was kind of moving around and wasn't really making very much progress. Uh, um, and inside it, there were these things all kind of shooting around. Those were one-dimensional, like sort of worms that can move forwards and backwards. Uh, a lot of folks have worked on, we call them swap worms. Now I'm calling them diamond chain because in this particular case, those particular type of swap worms are restricted. They, they need the, to have the grid around them in order to function uh, like that. So uh, diamond chain uh, is you know going to be inside the thing carrying the program, carrying the program, and there's going to be some kind of interpreter in the mother, inside the grid, that's going to go through that and it's going to cause it to go through this life cycle. So step number one is to get the diamond to grow to twice its radius, it makes it four times the area. Uh, uh, the next step is to reorganize the uh, genetic information in particular. It's got to move it out of the center over to the side. Once we've done that, we can copy the genetic information. Whoops copy the genetic information in place uh, to the other side of the thing. And now we have two complete copies of the genetic information, which is really the key thing. Well, of course, we need the interpreter too, but we're going to make that simple. And then finally, we cut the diamond in into four pieces. We let the top and bottom pieces wither away. And now we've got mother and daughter and the cycle can repeat. That's the plan. <laughs> you know, how hard could it be? Uh, uh, so this is basically what I just said. So I'm not going to go through it all again. Uh, uh, but the diamond chains Hold the code. Specialized processor. The processor is going to be in the HC in the grid itself. We're going to have a special kind of processor because the processor actually only needs. It doesn't really need much state of its own. It's going to just be managing. When I see a thing here, I'm going to treat that as an instruction. I'm going to treat this thing over here as a register. This thing is input. This thing is output. It's going to be doing a very simple little sequencing uh, when it gets all the pieces coming together. Then we have to make a whole bunch of instructions in this new language that we are inventing uh, uh, that's going to be done one instruction per segment in the diamond chain and as I start working through it, it seems clear that the most important things that the instructions are going to need to do, in addition to general configuration, like tell the HC3 diamond that its maximum hops should go up so that it will it will just grow naturally, sort of like a, a membrane a, a, or soap film, that sort of thing that just kind of stretches and does its thing without a lot of direct control. In addition, the main thing that we're going to need to be sequencing is the uh, operations on the chain. Copy the head, move the head here, swap the head with the thing, uh, copy it, turn it around in a link, in, in a loop, release it, and so on. So that's what we're going to be developing instructions for that the in, uh, in processor will use to make other chains grow and get cut and removed and so on and so forth. Finally, using those instructions, figure out how to write the ancestor that will produce that series of the the uh, diamond uh, grid life cycle that we just saw okay
uh, uh, grow the mother big enough, reorganize, copy, split, done. <laughs> How hard could it be? <laughs> Uh, uh, all right. Well, m the goal that I was supposed to come up with was to come up with monthly plans to reach this by January. This is the plan. I'm not going to go through all of them because I'm really going to try to keep this short. Uh, uh, so the July, which is already in, in place, is the code strands. That's the diamond chain. So we've got them as a sort of backbone, like a file format now exists, but we have no instructions to put inside one of those files. So we've got to take those strands and start figuring out a framework of, you know, class hierarchy or, or, or whatever it is to, to do instructions like chain operations, like duplicate, swap, cut, you know, that kind of thing. In addition, the uh, diamond chains that we saw here were both open at both ends and they were, they were moving forward and backward and so forth. We do not at the moment have any technology to make a diamond chain in a loop, which I really want because programs have loops. So it's, <laughs> have <laughs> the, the code actually physically in a loop and we'll just move it around and around like doing the rosary while we uh, are like copying the uh, another copy another chain that sort of thing and you know it's easy enough to get a uh, uh, two ends if they happen to come next to each other to link up and make a loop it's harder to say if we're trying to grow from a single spot and have a loop spread out from here uh, because it involves the the F segments not just growing and moving in the spots, but moving into a j open into open spaces without being a head or a tail, and that's going to take some extra work. So that's going to be the, one of the main focuses for the program design for the next T Tuesday update. Beyond that. I will talk about the uh, additional steps uh, as we get to them. I mean, so oh, November once again. I'm going to take off. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll not have T-Tuesday updates in November, and the focus is going to be on fiction and outreach and publishing as it has been for the last couple of years with Nano Remo and so forth. Not going to do Nano Remo, but uh, going to get stuff out there. <clears throat> December, simulated evolution, question mark, stretch goal. So, you know, all of this is, you know, it, it may not look like much, but it's terrifying to me, which is good because, it, you know, helps me to say, you know, if we're going to uh, catch this ball, we need to start running now. Uh, uh, um, so if, if we need December to do uh, grow to X, redeploy centers, cut, well, then we will. But if things go well, and they might, I, I feel a little confident, well, not confident, but I feel a little good. Made the progress uh, this week, the amount of progress since the last update, I feel okay with. Then we're going to put the additional step in of maybe while we're copying the genetic code from the mother to the daughter, put in some chance of actually flipping bits, uh, causing uh, the potential for uh, deliberate potential for, in this case, simulated evolution. Uh, uh, we'll see. But I will be perfectly happy if we just say no. <laughs> uh, uh, try to reproduce faithfully and have those kids reproduce faithfully. So by January, the ancestor code that we wrote by hand and we'll be able to see it grandchildren. That's the goal. All right, uh, uh, where we got here, you know, so we've been working on hard cell three, which, you know, the uh, st steps are three apart, which means we end up having these little two by two pockets of nothing, of empty space, the big advantage of HC3. Uh, uh, but those things don't necessarily always stay two by two. Uh, uh, when the uh, when an atom of HC3 decides to move to catch up with another one, oh, actually, uh, this, this is a little bit mis mislaid out. These should be two by twos up there. Well, it's okay. Uh, uh, the, the ones in the direction get squeezed down from two by two to one by two, and the ones in the trailing direction get stretched from two by two to two by three, uh, and so forth. And, you know, if we're going to, anything that's going to live inside those pockets needs to be okay with that. And so that means a couple of things. Number one, it means no more than two occupied sites per pocket. So when they get squished down like this, uh, there's room for them all. And number two, it means anything that's in that pocket needs to be okay with the outside world rearranging where those two things are with relation to each other because the HC3 just goes ahead and says, sorry guys, I gotta squish you up here. And that's exactly what the diamond chain that we've been doing uh, for this update is comfortable. It's all designed for that. Now, as I sort of started to switch from grid focused, HC3 focused to pocket focused, things start to shift a little bit. And in particular, now what we're really concerned with is, okay, we are content inside 
one of these pockets and we want to know is it okay to update is it okay to change things so now we've got a new uh, hc uh, pocket hc3 class that we can call that analyzes the situation and gives us back status information this pocket is good do whatever you want this pocket is missing at least one pole of its hc3 so it's open these are this one's okay it's a two by one uh, a two by one this one's a two by three these two the hc3 grid items are in the process of rearranging so they don't make a, a clean rectangle so this their status is bent and when uh, one of our pocket contents is finds itself in a bent pocket it just says I'm gonna wait I'm gonna wait for better days gets another event when it finds that it's okay then it goes ahead and that's been working fine it causes a certain amount of slowdown but hey this is the trade-off for going bigger uh, uh, all right so um, Again, you know, I've alluded to most of this. The important points for us is that, you know, one segment per pocket. I tried to do two, but it caused too much trouble. Uh, uh, and when we're talking about where the upstream, the, toward the head and toward the tail of the body of the chain is, it means not in adjacent sites, but adjacent pockets, the pocket to north, south, west or east is where to look for the uh, one ahead or one behind as it is. And we have automatic routines now that let us iterate over the pockets if we can see them to find our neighbors and so forth. Uh, uh, oh yeah, and okay, so I've got one more quick demo and then I will stop. Uh, um, all right, this is uh, the simulator uh, running. So uh, you can see the diamond, it's got the two uh, um, uh, diamond chains rattling around in there just at random but this is a display called the change age display which is kind of a, a fun feature of the MFMS simulator that what it does is it keeps track for each site in the whole grid it keeps track of the last time it changed not the last time it got an event because if it gets an event and, and it was empty before and it's empty afterwards that's not interesting but when it changes it records that and then we display the colors from the bright white for something that changed really recently to dark deep blue and black for things that haven't changed in a long time so there was the end cutting back to uh, um, turning off the change age stuff so that we could actually see the grid with the stuff running around in it so that's it that's the state that we're at uh, um, you know uh, the living computation foundation I'm gonna take just one minute on this we've got new folks uh, showing up in the discord I had a great conversation uh, yesterday the day before that was great thanks I'm really glad folks are coming by the living computation foundation is now a publisher in the sense that uh, I bought a block of ISBNs which was really expensive uh, uh, and now we have an imprint uh, we can publish books under the name of living computation foundation who knows maybe uh, we can you use it for you know collections of papers and thoughts of stuff related to living computation it doesn't even have to be by me necessarily although that's why i did it and finally we've uh, reached 800 subscribers on youtube actually we're now at 801 you know this is you know <laughs> the slowest rising but persistent uh channels you know we get like 10 10 uh, new subscribers a month we're at 800 i love you folks thank you for coming uh, uh and that's it the next update will be july 19th I have some a long overdue writing for the Santa Fe Institute that I have to finish off. Uh, my next goal is to somehow format something so that it will look book-like, so that I can start moving it down the road. The research and development segment is take those diamond chains, start to build up the structure to allow them to be code, to be instructions, and see if we can't figure out a way to, starting from a single point, sprout out a loop uh, uh, diamond chain rather than an open-ended one and have some fun. You have some fun too. Thanks so much for stopping by. I hope to see you next time.